So, in the last several weeks, we've talked about the hatred of the world. Jesus talking about how the world at large is going to hate us because of our faith in Jesus. And we talked about last week our need to witness to that world. There's a love that God has for us. There's a love that Jesus has for us. And it's a love that we're supposed to take to the hating world. And, you know, at a certain level, there, there's something that's understandable about that. I mean, when your enemy hates you, there's, there's nothing surprising about it. I mean, if we were to live in World War II times, and we were to think, okay, Nazis bad. Americans good. Nazis bad. Americans good. Italians bad. Americans good. Japanese bad. Good. I like anime. <laughs> so we have these enemies, you know, that. that are out there, you know, people that Jesus wants us to love. And dealing with the hatred that comes from our enemies can seem natural because we understand it, but, but what can be a lot harder to deal with is when people who are supposed to be on our side are attacking us and are, and are not supporting us. You know, if we're at school and there's this person that we just don't like, if we're at school and there's this person that we just hate, it kind of makes sense that they would hate us because they hate us. Haters gonna hate. They hate us because they hate us. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, when I was in when I was in school, you know, like I've told to you guys before, me and my group of friends, Elizabeth, Megan, and Chloe, we we were always compadres. You know, we were always running around playing together, having a good time. And you know, the rest of the people were the rest of the people. They hated us because they hate us. You know, and that's just what haters do. Haters gonna hate. Oh my god. And, that expression is so <laughs> and you know, it, it's it's just it's just easy to deal with. But then one day, as I've told you guys before, Chloe and Megan did this Judas act on us. And they just started hating us. And it was so hard to deal with because they were supposed to be on our side. And that was really hard for me to deal with. Emotionally, psychologically. It was really hard for me to wrap my head around because Chloe and Megan, they were supposed to be good people. How could they hurt us so like that? And that was tough. Oh, you know the expression, friends come and go, but family is forever. It was tough. You know, there are a lot of sayings that we have since that came up. You know, like blood is thicker than water, and family might stick around forever. But it's not really true. Jesus talks about how our deepest enemies can be in our own families because our own family doesn't entirely understand all the time who Jesus is and about the importance of Jesus. They say that blood is thicker than water. Blood symbolizing our family. Water symbolizing the spirit. Water symbolizing our faith. The reality is that our spiritual family is going to last for eternity. And a lot of our blood relatives are going to go to hell. A lot of my blood relatives 
are going to go to hell because they reject Jesus. They don't want to have anything to do with Him. And unless they repent, unless they come into faith in Jesus, they're not going to go to heaven. It's too late for some of my family members because they've already died rejecting Jesus and so they're already in hell. But our spiritual family is going to last forever. So while blood may be thicker than water, water lasts for eternity and blood goes away. But Jesus talks about how people who are supposed to be in our spiritual family are not always going to be on our side like they should. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues, Yes, the time is coming that whosoever kills you, that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things I have told you, that when a time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. Did you know that there are people out there, that there are Muslim jihadis that are out there that kill and behead and, and kill Christians? And they think that they're doing God a service? It's a fulfillment of this verse. Jesus said that the time would come when people would kill you, thinking that they're offering God a service. There are now people running around this planet killing Christians, thinking that they're offering God a service. Yeah. Bless you. Thanks. However, Jesus is saying that they'll put you Christians, they'll put you followers of me out of the synagogue. Now what's the synagogue? The synagogue is, is the assembly of believers, the assembly of the Jews who are supposed to be the people of God. Remember, God chose the children of Israel. God chose the Jewish people to be His people. You have Moses giving the Ten Commandments to Jews. He didn't give it to Englishmen like me. He didn't give it to Koreans. He didn't give it to Chinese. All my ancestors, all my family that was alive during Moses' day they're all dying apart from God. They're all dying apart from a relationship with Jesus. They're all dying apart from a relationship with Yahweh. God chose the Jewish people to be His people. God chose the Jewish prophets to carry His message. God chose the Jewish people. He supernaturally protected them with the ten plagues that He sent on Egypt, destroying the mightiest nation on earth. It'd be like God destroying the United States of America so that He could choose a people out of America, rescue them from their bondage, and give them a new land. God chose the mightiest nation on earth and destroyed it with, that, with ten plagues so that He could rescue this people. He showed this people His power. He made water come from where there was no water. He made birds appear from where there were no birds so that they could eat. He made wafers appear from where there were no wafers so that the children of Israel could, for 40 years, eat angels' food. He made it so that for 40 years, the children of Israel never had a shirt that tore, or a sandal that wore through. I wear through a lot of shoes. I work on my feet. It takes me about three months 
to wear through a pair of shoes so that the soles are all gone and so that they're all tattered. Maybe your shoes don't get a chance to last that long because you're still growing up. Your feet keep growing. But if you hold the same foot size, your shoes will grow old and they'll tatter. Well, for 40 years, that never happened to the children of Israel. Then for 1,400 years, God visited His people, the Jews, and He showed them supernatural signs. He showed them miracles so that there would be no denying that God was God. He gave them the prophets so that there would be no denying that His people were His people. Yet His people were going to reject God. And the tragedy is that the very prophets that God sent the Jewish people were rejected by the Jewish people. Jeremiah brought the Word of God. And what was his reward? He was thrown in jail. He was thrown in a pit. And they threw, they threw fecal matter onto him. Because he brought the Word of God. Isaiah wrote one of the best books of the Bible. And the Jewish people, they loved him so much, they took a wooden saw and hacked him in two. Sarcasm, right? No, that's how they killed him. No, sarcasm as that they really loved him? They really loved him. Okay, sarcasm. They really loved him so much. Why a wooden saw? You look at the ultimate prophet, Jesus. And by the time he shows up, the Jewish people love him so much, they crucify him. Sarcasm again. Okay. Yeah. Sarcasm, <laughs> yeah. But it's hard. When your friends, when your family, when the people who are supposed to be on your side hate you, it really hurts. It really hurts. But it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53.1, who has it? Oh. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Isaiah 53.1. While we're waiting for it, Psalm 118, 22 through 23. The stones that build... The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Okay, so you've got this idea of a building that God is constructing, the church. The chief cornerstone is going to be rejected by the people. Who has Isaiah 53.1? And who has believed our message and who has the arm of the Lord have been revealed? Who has believed our message. The implication, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Not very many. It's established that the Jewish people are going to reject God when He sends His Messiah. And yet, this is for our good. Who has Romans 11, 15? Okay, so Rome, in Romans, Paul is talking about the Jewish people and how their rejection of Jesus brought life to the Gentile people. We English, we Korean, we Gentile, we have the chance of having a relationship with Jesus because they rejected their Messiah. And so God is trying to use us Gentiles to make His people, the Jewish people, jealous so that they will come to faith. But if their rejection of the Messiah caused so much good in the world that it brought the chance for us Gentiles to have faith 
in Jesus. Paul is saying that how much more good will come when the whole G Jewish people come to faith in Jesus. In Romans 11.15 he says, it'll be life from the dead. It'll be the resurrection. That's why it's so important that we witness to Jews. I was talking about this message a couple years ago about how important Jews are and how important it is that we witness to Jews and how, and how we share with them the love of God and, 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 and how great it will be when all the Jews come to faith. And this, this skeptic, this atheist wrote back to me and said, well you're just saying that because you're Jewish. I'm not Jewish, I'm, I'm English. Not, you know, there might be a drop of blood in me back in there somewhere, but <laughs> trust, me, trust me, it ain't significant. Trust me. The agony of the Jewish rejection of God would be like the church rejecting God. And there are many people in the church who will reject God. Turn me, with me, if you will, to Matthew 25. Um, historically, historically, we can see how some of the greatest Christian movements have gone bad. Historically, we can see how some of the greatest Christian movements have gone bad. You look at the start of the Roman Catholic Church, one of the best institutions that this world has seen at its conception, and yet over time, which has allowed so many heretical doctrines creep into its midst, to the point where the, the leader of their church is now running around the, you know, the world saying, you know, atheists, if they do good works, can be saved. You know, completely no basis in the Bible, completely no basis in, in theological fact, and yet the Roman Catholic organization has descended and been corrupted so much that now it's got a pontiff that's going around saying that atheists could be saved. The ultimate in works righteousness, the ultimate in rejection of what the Bible actually teaches is being celebrated by this heretic who goes around calling himself Pope Francis. You have groups like the Presbyterians, which started out as wonderful organizations. John Calvin, in my mind, one of the best Christians who's ever walked the face of the earth. Now, the Presbyterian Church is celebrating the immorality of homosexuality, the immorality of lesbianism, the immorality of, of, of same-sex perversion and they're going around saying that this sin that is so bad that in the Bible it says that if you do this you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in 1 Corinthians 6 9 it specifically lists homosexuality as such a bad sin that if you do this if you practice this you will not go to heaven. Wait, aren't we a Presbyterian church? We're non-denominational. Joy, Joy Church is non-denominational. And by Presbyterians, I mean, I mean Presbyterians like PCUSA. And I don't necessarily mean the, uh, the Korean Presbyterian church that we're affiliated with. I thought we were Protestant. I think. We are Protestant. Huh? We are a group of Protestant. <laughs> We are, but our church name used to be like something, something Presbyterian. Right. We are affiliated with a form of Presbyterian, but we aren't the type of mainline Presbyterian that I'm referring to. We're a sub-branch of a sub-group of Presbyterian that is good because we don't endorse that type of sin like the mainline PCUSA group is. You look at groups like the Methodists, started by John Wesley, which 
again, one of the greatest Christians that, in my mind, has ever walked the face of the earth. And yet, over the hundreds of years since he's founded that church, that church has allowed itself to become corrupted. It, it allowed itself to endorse a lot of skepticism, which has led to a lot of outright, outright heresies in the movement. And we can see on this macro level how whole church groups can start good, like the Catholic Church started great, but then over the hundreds of years adopted heresies where it's gotten to the point where it, it there's a lot of things that are wrong with it. And the same thing with the Presbyterians, same thing with the Methodists. There's no one brand name that's sacred. What's sacred is gone. I mean, 100 years from now, if Joy Church is still around, there's no guarantee that Joy Church will still be a good place to go. It's about staying faithful to God's Word and not about the brand name. But it's hard. It's hard emotionally to wrap our minds around it because we don't want to go away from what we know. We don't want to go away from the community that we've loved. But Christians will turn their back on God. People who call themselves Christians would deny important doctrines, would attack purity stands that other Christians will make. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is at a similar period in his life which we're studying in the book of John. This sermon he gives takes place just a few days before this last night of his life that we're looking at. Jesus said, When the Son of Man, referring to himself, comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him. So he's talking about the end of time. He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave Me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous are going to be like, what? The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry? You ever saw Jesus on the side of the road hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger, and take you in, and naked, and clothed you? Last time I checked, I never saw a naked Jesus. Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of one of these my children, one of these my brethren, you did it to me. When we help out other Christians, when we encourage other Christians, when we encourage other people, when we clothe them, when we give them food, when we give them water, Jesus counts it as if we were helping out Him. Then He will say to those on His left hand, Depart from Me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. And in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Never saw you hungry, Jesus. I never saw you thirsty. Never saw you as a stranger, sick, or in prison. Last time I checked, I've never had a prisoner watch for Jesus Christ. And did not minister to you. Then he will answer to them and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to me, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's this separation that God's going to do. And it's His judgment to make. It's not our judgment to make. It's not our job to point sinners. We don't point sinners. We don't point saying, you know, wicked, you help. That's, that's not our call to make. When someone calls themselves a believer, it's not our job to judge them as guilty of an eternal sin that they'll go to hell for. We are called to judge them, but we're not called to judge them. What do I mean? We're called to judge them in the sense that we say, look, you need to change your life. Look, you need to become more like Jesus. Look, you're sinning. You need to stop. We have that charge in the book of Corinthians. We have that ministry where we are called to tell other Christians, look, you're living in too much compromise. You need to cut it out. But we're not called to judge in the sense that we're not called to condemn. We're not supposed to say, you know what, Ben? I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're going to hell. It's not our place. It's not our place. God will judge His people. From the principles of God's Word, you know, maybe we can know. Is there a chance that Osama bin Laden's in hell, heaven, that at the last second before an, a Navy SEAL shot him in the head, that he said, you know what, Jesus? All this terrorist stuff that I did, I'm sorry. I believe in you. I accept you as my Savior. Jesus, I confess to you. Is it possible? Sure. Is it likely? I doubt it. <laughs> you know, I... I've said on many occasions that Osama bin Laden's in hell. I don't see any evidence to the contrary that he became a Christian in the final hours of his life. I think it's a pretty safe conclusion to say that bin Laden's in hell. I don't think that there's any evidence to the contrary that he became a Christian. From the principles of God's Word, we can understand how God is going to judge. And it's our job to proclaim God's standards. It's not our job to condemn another Christian. It's, that's Christ's job, to judge whether or not you as a Christian are doing life for him or whether you're doing life for you. I mean, when you see Christians attacking doctrines in the Bible, when you see Christians attacking the purity standards of God, when you see Christians who are mocking the idea of obedience to God, when you see Christians who are mocking the idea of trying to live a holy life. Danger, danger, danger. Dangerous. It's not a good sign. You know, when you see a Christian, and you know, you talk about God and they just don't care. That's 
dangerous. It's not our place to judge. We don't point fingers. We don't condemn. You know, but Jesus talks in this section in, in, in John about how the people of God will reject the apostles. And we saw that in the first century context of the Jewish people rejecting the message of the Messiah. We can see that in our modern context. We can see that in our daily lives. The rejection of God from people who are claiming to be Christians. For me, you know, it, 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 it's something that is very frustrating because I don't understand how a person could believe in Jesus and not take the, the faith seriously. I mean, unless we're just kind of going through the motions, unless we're just doing it as some sort of fire insurance, you know, it might be true. I, I, I just don't understand how people can't take God more seriously than they do. I, I, I posted a, a, a picture on my ministry page on Facebook this morning. And it was a picture that said, if people took Jesus as seriously as they took football, our world would be a better place. I don't know, but you understand the principle. You understand the principle. If we took Jesus as seriously as we took Pokemon, if we took Jesus as seriously as we took school, um, our lives would hopefully be in a better place. You understand the principle that I'm making, even if football is not your thing. And I'm sorry to say it, but football is not my thing. You know, my, you know, it, my addiction is more in the Pokemon area of things, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, you know, it's something that I definitely need to work on, tempering. But when we follow after God we find that it's not a chore. We find that it's not a burden. Remember the two greatest commandments that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Love is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Remember the name of our church, Joy Church? When we follow after God the way that we should, we'll be full of joy. We'll be full of joy. Jesus said that following after him is not burdensome. It's a joy. It, it, it's a privilege. We have this privilege. And it's not, oh my God, i got to follow after Jesus again. Oh my God, i got to sing another song. I can't believe Pastor Jim is choosing the worst songs. He was like, you have 13 good songs and you choose the two that I don't like at all. You know, and I think today we had a really hard time focusing on our worship section. The distractions of this life can become so much more real to us that while we don't make a decision to reject Jesus, we just find other things more enticing that we push Jesus aside for whatever's on the phone that we push aside our chance to worship God. And, you know, trying to lead in worship, 
trying to find my own peace in worshiping God is really hard when there are so many different distractions. And there are always distractions. You know, the devil is always going to make it so that we want to do something other than what we're supposed to do. But when we prioritize our conversations and we just don't care about our brothers and sisters who are trying to worship, who are trying to praise Jesus, it's not fair to those of us who want to express our love to God. It's not fair to God that we don't want to praise Him. Because God is worthy of our praise. And it's not fair to ourselves because we cheat and we rob ourselves of the chance to experience the joy of worshiping God. And today, I was trying to find a way to lovingly talk about But I was just, ugh, this is frustrating. Because we're trying to worship God. And you know, I I I I I, I don't know how to adequately express and adequately convey how hurtful it was to me that there was absolutely no interest today in worshiping God from a lot of people. And that was clearly demonstrated by not just the flavored comments about it, but also a complete and utter disregard for the praise that we were supposed to be singing. However, this is a nice place. This is a loving place. This is a gracious place. There's no animosity that's going to be felt here. You know, we all have a chance to make our mistakes, to learn from them, and grow in the future. I've done a lot of horrible, rotten things in the past. And guess what? We all will. None of us are going to be perfect. None of us are going to be able to take the standards of God perfectly in our lives. None of us are going to be able to take the standards of God perfectly in any one day or in any one hour. But we can try to take God seriously. We can try to take important elements of worshiping God, like singing to God in praise, seriously. And we can make an attempt to be respectful of others. And I don't want to name any names, and I don't want to point any fingers. But I know that there were a few people here, at least today, that wanted to take the worship seriously because worship, for some of us, is the favorite part of church. And when the rest of us act in such a disrespectful way, it hurts those of us who are trying to worship God. We don't want to reject God by finding the things of this world more interesting. But there's grace, there's love, there's acceptance, because none of us are perfect. Remember the very first thing that you, I said to you about two years ago two was years. two years in November. 
I already forgot that. Which is in two months. The very first four words that I said to you were, I am a sinner. I'm going to need your grace. I am a sinner. That's the first four words that I said to this group. Dude, how do you remember the first four words you said two years ago? Because it was very deliberate. And I wanted you guys to know that I was going to screw up a lot. <laughs> and no matter how good I get in Christ, no matter how mature I get in Christ, I'm still going to be a sinner. I'm still going to screw up a lot. We all will. That's why there's grace. That's why there's love. That's why we move forward in joy as a community, forgiving one another, honoring one another. But, encouraging each other not to perpetuate rude and hurtful behavior in the church. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, there's no easy way for us to look at Christians rejecting Christ. And, and Lord, I pray that Your grace, that Your love, that Your joy would fill our hearts as we understand that we forgive one another, that we love one another, that we're kind to one another. And I pray, Lord, that You would help us to move forward for You in this spirit of grace, in this spirit of love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. All right. Let's well, we turn off the camera. Oh, before.